heal this place. We want to be with you, and you want to be with your people. Thank you for your presence. In his presence, there is fullness of joy. At his right hand, pleasures evermore. In his presence, there's a river that flows abundantly, full of joy, full of peace, full of love, full of correction, full of faithfulness. In that river is where I want to live, in the river of his mercy and grace. How about you? Come on, there is a river. Come on, put your hands together. Come on, lift your voice. There is a river.
Genesis, when he breathed into Adam the breath of life and he became a living soul. I think about that with this song. Right now, you just took a breath, and that's the breath of life. He just breathed into you. As long as you're taking a breath, that's him breathing into you. People of God, we ought to thank him this morning. He's most worthy of praise. Worship him. You're a great God. You give life, you are love. You give life, you are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope, you restore. You restore. Give life, you are love. You give life, you are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you. Great are you, my Lord. 
one I praise. All the earth will shout his praise. Our hearts will cry. These old bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. No matter how your bones feel this morning, you have a reason to sing out to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's been good, hasn't he? He's been faithful. He's been kind. He's been merciful. You woke up this morning with brand new mercy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, sing. All the earth will shout. is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Yes. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Lift your voice and sing all the earth. Come on, shout Christ the rock. to describe so many things 
that we diminish the definition of great when it comes to you. But it really means great. You're sovereign. There are no inconsistencies. There's no forgetfulness. No unfaithfulness. You are absolutely great. We could go on and on to describe who you are. And time would not give us enough to describe the greatness of our God, the grandeur, the majesty of who you are. Forgive us because we have become so irreverent to your name. We've just forgotten how great you are. You're great in this world. You're great in our lives. You're great in your church. You're doing a work to glorify yourself. We thank you this morning that we've been able to sing out to you. That we've been able to clap our hands and raise our hands because you really are worthy of all the praise and glory. You really are worthy. You're worthy. Great is the Lord and worthy of all the praise. We pray for your servant this morning as he comes to bring the word again to this body of believers. Lord, let us hear. Not just with our ears. Let us have a spiritual sense of hearing what you are speaking to us corporately and individually that we'll be the people that you called us to be bringing glory and honor to your name and your name alone it's in Jesus name we pray and all of his people said would you greet someone in the house of the Lord this morning singing grace singing grace sure to download our official CRCC app for iPhone or Android so that you can keep up with everything happening at CRCC. It's also a great way to give securely. This is our Hang 10 weekend here at CRCC. We're asking you to give just $10 towards Family Fun Night after tides. Head over to our app and hit give. Then tap Hang 10 FFN where you'll be prompted to complete the process. You can also log on to crcconline.org and click give to do the same thing from your browser. This field gets transformed to host thousands of people here on our campus at Family Fun Night, and this will be our 20th year hosting. Are you interested in sponsoring one of the biggest events of the year? Pick up a sponsorship package from the lobby to see how you can partner with us through your business. As always, don't forget to bring your lawn chair so you can sit back, relax, and enjoy the happenings on stage. Every year as we prepare for Family Fun Night, we also prepare and direct our efforts towards a local outreach. We've worked hand in hand with the Heart to Heart Ministry since 2013 to serve veterans at the Alexander Nininger State Veterans Nursing Home in Pembroke Pines. With these veterans in mind, we invite you to pick up a checklist to participate in our veterans collection. We thank you for your generosity and for joining us in giving back to the local community of veterans that God has placed in our midst.
that's it for this week. Now, let's continue to lead people to an ever-growing personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, good morning. This is the day the Lord hath made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. Can we give our Lord a hand clap of praise? We bless the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praises shall continually be in my mouth. I do greet you in divine love. And before I get to my other announcements, pastoral announcements, I think it's important for us to pause and pray for our brothers and sisters that's trying to put their lives back together. That hurricane was devastating. Devastating. So as people are coming in, even as they're coming in now, could we just pause right now and just pray for them? Father, we pause and we pray. For some, we know that scene very well. We have seen it before in our area. But today is not about us, it's about them. Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters suffering from Hurricane Michael. Lives completely changed forever. Lord, we pray for resources. We pray, Lord Jesus, that no one would take advantage of those who are in great need right now. Father, we pray for comfort that only comes from you. For the families that lost loved ones, Father, we pray comfort. Comfort, Lord Jesus. Father, we pray that you would send resources and send people there to care for them and love them and support them. We pray for the church of Jesus Christ in the area that you would empower the people of God to live the truth of God's word, that earth has no sorrow, that heaven cannot heal. And so, Lord, we pray for them now. Would you bless them? May, this, may the recovery be so strong and be so fast that they would marvel at your great power. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray, and everyone said, amen, amen. Okay, now with that said, I'm so excited about Family Fun Night. Family Fun Night is right around the corner inside of your bulletin. Please take note of the veterans collection items here. And maybe you want to be a part of this ministry. This is an incredible ministry. Every month we go to the veterans home, a local veterans home, not far from here. Our youth have gone. We have a great group of volunteers that go every month. And you'd be surprised at the stories that, I mean, we have people from World, World War II and others, uh, other wars that have served our country. And they're there. And we go and we, we sit with them. We play games and we just enjoy them. We have communion with them. And they, they love it. And so these items will go to them. Maybe you have an interest to be a part of it. If you just put your name on the back of this card, your information, your contact information, you can drop this in the offering receptacle, and we'll come by, we'll call you, and let you be a part of what we're doing there in the, in the um, veterans' home. It's going to bless your life, of course. We're looking for people to be a part of Family Fun Night uh, 2018. We're excited. This is that special shirt that we've been talking about. This is a one-of-a-kind shirt. Look at that. Isn't that nice? Yes. Isn't that nice? Look at that. You can add it in the closet with all your other orange shirts. Okay, this one's different. And this is a one of a kind. This is just for this year only. And so that's out there. You have to pre-order it uh, at the media center. Of course, there are many other things out there. And I want to say this lastly, that we are having um, Hang 10 this weekend. That's just $10 towards Family Fun Night. Go on your phone. Everything's right there. You can be a part of that. And, of course, we are looking for worshipers. We're looking for men and women who love to sing. Can we thank God for our, our um, worship department? They're doing a great job. But some of you... Some of you have a gift, and your gift is singing. Maybe it's an instrument, and we want you to know there's a place for you on this stage, and we need you to be a part of that. So would you please consider that? And there's an there's easy way to be involved. Uh, just ask someone out there in the lobby. They'll show you how to do that. All right. Let's pray as we open God's word. Lord, today we thank you. We open your word. We open our hearts that you would speak to our hearts. We thank you for the power of your word that is active and is alive, is sharper than any double-edged sword. It divides the joints and the marrow. It judges the attitude and the actions of our hearts today. So search our hearts, Lord, today. Joshua chapter 9 is a, a, a chapter that will challenge everyone. May all of us leave changed by the power of your word today. And may no flesh get glory in the presence of our God. In Jesus' mighty name we pray and everyone said amen. Joshua chapter 9. Now, we've been in warfare for a while, and this is a different area of warfare. We have seen two great battles, actually three, but one in, in, the, in the same place. We saw the battles at Jericho and two battles at Ai. 
And now we come upon Joshua chapter 9, and this is still warfare, but it's a different tactic. It's a different way of warfare. You're not going to see swords. You're not going to see uh, uh, ambush. You're, you're not going to see fire. You're going to see another weapon in, in the arsenal of warfare. Someone said it this way, one defeat does not lose the battle and one victory does not win the war. <laughs> my, my brothers and sisters, as a child of God, we're constantly in warfare. We're constantly engaged in this battle. And, but most battle is, is pretty straightforward, but deception is an important factor in warfare. And that's what we're going to see, deception. In Joshua chapter 9, let's get right to the narrative. In Joshua chapter 9, uh, Joshua is, and the people of God, there's, some, there's a transition happening here. Look at verse number 1. When all the kings heard about Jericho and Ai, those who were rest, west of the Jordan, in the hill country, in the Judean foothills, and all the coasts of the Mediterranean Sea towards Lebanon, the Hittites and the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Pezzarites, the Hivatites, and the Jebusites, they formed, listen, they formed a unified alliance to fight against Joshua and Israel, okay? Now the enemy is changing their tactic. Now the kings are coming together. They heard about the great wars that have happened and how, they how each of the kings in Ai and Jericho failed miserably. Now the king said, let's form an alliance. Let's get together. Now it's about to heighten. Now, Jer now uh, uh, Joshua and the people of Israel, they won't be fighting a single foe. They'll be fighting several kingdoms at the same time. This is warfare, okay? Verse number three. When the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they acted deceptively. They gathered provisions and took worn out sacks on their donkeys and old wineskins cracked and mended. They wore old patched sandals on their feet and threadbare clothing on their bodies. Their entire provisions of bread was dry and crumbly. They went to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal and said to him and the men of Israel, we have come from a long distance. Please make a treaty with us. The men of Israel replied to the Hivetites, perhaps you live among us. How can we make a treaty with you? They said to Joshua, we are your servants. Then Joshua asked them, who are you and where did you come from? They replied to him, your servants have come from a far away land because of the reputation of the Lord your God. We have heard of his fame and all that he did in Egypt and all he did to the two Amorite kings beyond Jordan, Sion, king of Heshbon, and Og, king of Ashan, who was in Ashroth. So our elders and all the inhabitants of our land told us, take provisions with you for the journey. Go and meet them and say, we are your servants. Please make a treaty with us. This bread of ours was warm when we took it from our houses as food on the day we left to come to you. But look at it. It's now dry and crumbly. These wineskins were new when we filled them. But look, they are cracked. And these clothes and sandals of ours are worn out from the extremely long journey. Verse 14, then the men of Israel took some of their provisions, but did not seek the Lord's counsel. Yeah, you know something's about, about to happen here, right? Look at this, brothers. And, and, and we sit here, and, and I want to tell you what, what was about to happen. This is a different level of warfare. This is deception. You've already heard it twice. They, they deceived them. And, and let me tell you why I'm preaching this, why we're talking about warfare, why we're talking about it, especially during family fun night. We're talking about spiritual warfare because Family Fun Night is all about spiritual warfare. I remember 12 years ago when I came on staff as pastoral care pastor, and I was given the opportunity and the responsibility to preach. And it was in October, early October in 2006. And the pastor at that time told me, I need you to tell the people about Family Fun Night and remind them how they need to be involved because Family Fun Night was going on way before I came. 20 years has been going on. And I remember asking about this thing called Family Fun Night. I was amazed that thousands of people would come to this carnival. And I was, I was, I was amazed that, 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 that in this time of them being at the carnival, that there was an opportunity for them to know the Lord Jesus Christ. So when the Lord called me to be pastor, the first thing I did was to weaponize Family Fun Night. I made Family Fun Night. I've been speaking about Family Fun Night because I believe Family Fun Night is bigger than a carnival. Family Fun Night is when we lift up Jesus Christ and when we invite people to come to our campus and we spend $100,000 plus and we must lift up Jesus in that hour. Amen, church. Otherwise, it makes no sense. 
Why would we do family fun night? Why would we spend hours out there on the campus and give people hot dogs and give them some cotton candy and tell them, good luck? (laughs) Kids don't need candy. Kids need Jesus. Amen. 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 And so, brothers and sisters, this is why FFN, when it comes to FFN, the very task of his mission places us in the sights of the enemy now that we have declared war because we're seeking to reach non-believers. We're seeking to develop strong disciples and to build a healthy congregation that can plant more healthy congregations, all of which means that we are offensively engaging in the enemy's territory, and we can know that the enemy will fight back. Family fun night is a serious thing. And what we see in Joshua chapter 9 is a serious thing. This is not fight, open warfare. The first point today is deception. Deception. The Bible makes it clear that these men purposely put on old clothes. They got old bread. They got old wineskins. And they were trying to communicate to Joshua and to the men of Israel, we're just like you. We have come from a far country just like you. We have traveled a long distance just like you. But watch this. Here's the difference. Their sandals were worn out, but the children of Israel's sandals, they were not worn out. They were not like them. And, but they were deceived because Joshua and the men of Israel were looking on the outward appearance. And they figured that the Gibeonites were very crafty. The other kings, early in chapter one, I mean, chapter nine, verse one and two, the kings got together. They got their military forces together. They said, let's get together these five kings. Let's come together. Let's put all of our resources together because we're going to go after Joshua and Israel. But the Gibeonites says, wait a minute. Let's not go with them with a sword. Let's go with them with, with another way. Let's go with them, go to them with deception. Let's identify with them. Let's tell them, hey, we're just like you. That we have come from a long place just like you, and we want to make a treaty with you. We want to be at peace with you. They were deceiving them. Can I tell you where deception came from? Let's go to uh, uh, Revelation chapter 12. Let me show you where deception came from. This is what the Bible says. And can I tell you how old war is? War in the body is a long, there's been a long battle going on. This battle uh, has been a long time coming. In fact, war happened in heaven first. In Revelation 12 and verse number 7, then war broke out in heaven. Can you imagine this place? Heaven? <laughs> where there's peace, where God is, the very God is there, not the, the presence of God is there, visible. War broke out in that peaceful place, yes. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels also fought, but he could not prevail, and there was no place for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was thrown out, the ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the one who deceives the whole world. Deception. He deceived a third of the angels. And if he could convince a third of the angels that God was unfair, what could he do with us mere mortal people? The Bible says he deceives the whole world, but I love this. The Bible says there was no place found for him, so God kicked him out of heaven. Thank you, Lord. And in, if you look at Luke chapter 10, Jesus will say to his disciples, I saw him fall. <laughs> I pushed him out, in other words. <laughs> and the war continues today. And one of the greatest weapons is not an affront. It's not what you see in front of you, but it's what you don't perceive. It's deception. And this is what we see. Later on, Paul will recognize this deception as he's talking to the church at Corinth. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul calls out this, this, this uh, deception that's rampant. It was in heaven, and now it's in the church. This is what he says, verse number 13. For such people are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. As an angel of light, he disguises himself as an angel of light. So there's no great thing that his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their destiny will be according to their works. In other words, God says, listen, I'm going to deal with deception in the church, especially with leadership. Jesus will say later on in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, in that day, many will come and say, Lord, I've done these great things in your name. But Jesus is going to say, yeah, you did those great things, but I did not know you. 
And that word know is the same word where you see uh, Adam knew Eve, which, which means God says, I was not intimate with you. You were not a part of me. We were not joined together. Brothers and sisters, deception. These people said, we are just like you. And, and, and look what happened. They said to Joshua, verse number eight, we are your servants. And then Joshua asked them a question. To show you how deceived Joshua was, Joshua asked them to define who they were. He says, now who are you and where did you come from? He opened himself up for deception. Joshua should have asked God, who are they and where did they come from? But he's asking them. He's opened himself up for deception, brothers and sisters. Listen, the only way to fight deception is that you have to have counsel from God. They say, we're just like you. In fact, we're just like you. In fact, we are your servants. And so they replied to him, your servants. Not only did they say, we are your servants, and then they assumed the position, verse number nine, your servants came from a faraway land. <laughs> they assumed the position. They're like, we're here, we're in, we're not going anywhere, we're here. And look at the lie, verse 11 through 13. Our elders sent us. No, they made that plan. They made this, they made this, 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 this plan, this scheme, and he fell for it. The men fell for it. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 14 says, Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived by Satan himself. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5 through 11, Paul is talking to the church, and the thing that sticks out here is Paul is telling them how to forgive and how they're supposed to walk in forgiveness and walk in love. He says that we will not be taken advantage of by, the, by Satan. He says you got to walk in love. you got to walk in forgiveness. Otherwise, Satan will take advantage of you. And he says, we are not ignorant to Satan's devices. Let me ask you something. Are you aware of Satan's devices? This is spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare does not call for a sword. It does not call for a shield. It does not call for a weapon. It calls for us to be aware, aware. Let me give you six areas that the, that the child of God must always be aware of Satan's devices. First of all is division. One of the things the enemy loves to do is to bring division. He brought division in heaven with the angels. He brings division. The one thing Jesus prayed for in John chapter 17 was, I pray not for these alone, but for those who will believe on me. May they be one. Jesus prayed that the, that the church will be one. As you, the Father, Son, we are one. Why? So that the world will believe. Jesus says when we are one, the world will believe that Jesus is Jesus. And if that is what will validate Jesus, you better believe that's what the enemy is going to try to tear down. Wrong agreements is another thing we have to be careful of. Don't be deceived. Wrong agreements. What does that mean? That we don't agree that this is the day the Lord hath made and, he's, and rejoice and be glad in it. We don't agree. We don't believe that God is with us. Who can be against us? We believe the report of the enemy. We believe that somehow your destiny is not in God's hands. And we begin to agree with the enemy as if now that you're in Christ, that you don't have a secure future. No, you have a secure future in Jesus Christ. Amen. Because power of life and death is in your tongue. If you hit every day on the floor and say, this is the day the Lord hath made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. You'd be surprised at how your day will go forward. But if you open the blind and say, look at all those clouds and miss the sun, it's not going to be a good day for you. Offense. Child of God, we got to be careful because offense is one of the greatest weapons that he uses because an offended heart is a shutdown heart. And Satan likes it when we hold on to bitterness and resentment in the house of the Lord. Let me be very clear with you. If you can hold a grudge, Satan can use you. He will use you. And guess what? He is using you. That's why we must forgive. The first words of our Savior on the cross was, Father, were, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Forgiveness. The next thing we must be aware of Satan's devices is ignorance and paranoia and insecurity and suspicion. These all go together because they all deal with truth and reality. Sometimes we're just ignorant. We just don't know. And it's about, as a matter of fact, God wants us to know. That's why we must study the word of God. We must learn the word. We must read the word of God. We got to know it for ourselves. Because if you don't know it, somebody will confuse you. Paranoid. To believe that things are not real that are real. To believe, to choose to believe the lie. Paranoid. Here's a big one. Insecurity. If you're insecure, 
that somehow you think that your, your identity is based on what people's acceptance of you. Your, your identity is based on your position. Your identity is based on who you think you are. See, Jesus knew who he was. He knew he'd come from the Father. He knew he was going back to the Father. He got up from the table, and he washed disciples' feet. You see the order? He knew who he was. He knew he'd come from the Father. He knew he was going back to the Father. Then he served. If you don't know who you are, you cannot serve. Just because you're washing dishes does not mean you're a dishwasher. You're a child of God. Amen, brothers and sisters. Yeah. Insecurity is a bad one. If you walk in a room and people are laughing and you think they're laughing at you, you have a problem. <laughs> Not necessarily them. <laughs> Insecure. You need to be secure in who Jesus says you are. And preach, I don't know that. Then study the scripture and find out who you are in Jesus. See, Satan is the father of lies, and I wish I had time to go there. Jesus will talk very stern with the Pharisees in John chapter 8. And he's very stern with them. He says, the you of your father, the devil, he is a father's of li- father of lies. He's never told the truth, and you're just like him. And why was Jesus coming rebuking them? Because they did not love him. He said, if you were of Abraham, you would love me. But because you are of your father, the devil, the father of lies, you cannot love me. Because what Jesus is saying, the characteristic of a, of a disciple is not your religious behavior. The characteristic of a disciple is your love. Is your love. Don't be deceived. It's not about your religious acts. It's about your love. And then next one is pride. You got to be aware. Don't be deceived. Satan will work real close with a prideful heart. Why? Because pride will cause you to deny any wrongdoings. You, you know those half-hearted apologies? Well, if you, think, if you think I meant that, then I'm sorry. What does that mean? Either you're sorry or you're not. Can we just get there? Now, you're looking at it. If, if, if that's how you see it, then I'm sorry. That's how you see it. That's nothing. It's not a whole full-throated apology. Brothers and sisters, full-throat apology. Humility says, no, I, I will admit that I have shortcomings. See, pride destroys. Pride destroys. Uh, 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 Proverbs 16 and 18, pride goes before destruction, and the Holy Spirit will come before a fall. Here's another thing. We've got to be careful. Don't be deceived. And that will be distractions. This is a big one. I believe more than ever before, the kingdom of God has been distracted. We're being distracted. God raised up the church to save the world. We have a mandate from Jesus Christ. Go preach and teach the gospel. Baptizing them. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you, what church? Always. That's the mandate for the church. <laughs> Jesus didn't die for us to have a, a political position. Amen, church. Those are nice. But the answer for the world is not a party. The answer for the world is Jesus Christ. And we can't be distracted. Be involved. Be involved at your level. But know there's a greater reason why you've been saved. (laughs) And we must be about our father's business. Let me read this quote. There are such things as church distractions because many of the things we do in church today have nothing to do with the church we read about in the New Testament. The New Testament church and Jesus were out and about ministering to the hurt and lost. Church today seems very into ministering to only those who are saved in the church's four walls. Many church folk would rather hold up a hurtful pro-life sign outside of an abortion clinic instead of kindly approaching the expectant mother, praying for her, asking her why she feels the need to do this, and offering her options other than abortion. Many Christians would hold up hateful signs at gay rallies and parades instead of pulling a homosexual to the side and praying for them and doing spiritual deliverance from the spirit of perversion. See, that's the power that we have. See, it's not an outward change. There needs to be an inward change. And that's what we should be about, brothers and sisters. Anything other than an inward change will never change a person. It's a new life in Jesus that changes a person. So someone asked the question, well, preacher, what happened to Joshua? 
Joshua had the very presence of God. Jesus met him in chapter, chapter, Jesus came down from heaven in a bodily form and met Joshua before any war and says, listen, I am the captain of the army and I've come down to give you victory. He saw the presence of God. He worshiped at the feet of Jesus. What happened? Second point today, first we saw the deception. Now we need to see the direction. This is what happened. They did not seek the Lord's counsel. Verse number 14, the men of Israel took some of their provisions. Watch this. They are so deceived until now they're eating from the enemy. They're taking of their provisions. They had their own provisions. Now they're eating their old bread and their old wine. They took their, pro, 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 their provisions, but they did not seek the Lord's counsel. What happened to Joshua? Joshua should have known better. We sit here and we can judge Joshua. Joshua should have known. Joshua had all these things going for him. And for many of us today, we cannot condemn Joshua because we make a lot of decisions without seeking the Lord's counsel. Hmm. I like this, this quote here. It's, uh, by David Butts, he says, the real danger for us is not the enemy's schemes, but being unaware of them and thus unprotected from them. We tend to approach difficulties in the church as though they were natural things. But when churches divide over whether to sing hymns or contemporary courses, it's, that's not natural. When the flock turns on the shepherd, it's not natural. When saints call to live in love and peace, spend their time criticizing and accusing one another, that's not natural. The devil has come to the church. Yeah. How can I know this? How can you know this? You got to seek the Lord's counsel. And that's what they missed. Let me show you the difference here. And, and take this journey with me. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Let me show you how this looks in, in, in real time. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul, uh, the apostle, is writing to the church. And Paul has an issue. He's writing to the church and he's challenging them on their beliefs. He's challenging them on their growth. And this is what, what, what uh, Paul says to the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 1. He says, brothers, I am not able to speak to you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh or carnal people. Now, carnal comes from a, a root word, which means flesh. Okay? But I want you to see the qualifier. He's calling them brothers. So he's not writing to the world. He's writing to brothers and sisters in Christ. And so he says, brothers and sisters in Christ... I, I would love to speak to you about spiritual matters. I would love to have a spiritual conversation with you. But I can see that you are in your flesh, and it goes on further to describe, as babies in Christ. So Paul says, I, I want to I have a deep conversation about God's idea for the church. I think when you get in Ephesians talking about how wide, how deep the love of Christ is, there are some things that Paul wanted to tell them about the thing called the church and how God's going to use the church to change the world. But Paul says, I can't tell you these things because you are fleshly, which means you are a baby in Christ. Verse number two, I gave you milk to drink, not solid food because you were not ready for it. In fact, you're still not ready because you are still fleshly since there is envy and strife among you. Are you not fleshly and living like an unbeliever? So Paul says you can be saved. You can be a part of the body of Christ and be a baby. You know what we did? We, we looked around the church and we, we called a carnal Christian. Can I show you? We got a carnal Christian. Tar, bring that carnal Christian out here. We found, we caught this carnal Christian in the back somewhere. And we, bring that carnal Christian. We called him. He was out there at the coffee bar. We called him. Carnal Christian. See, it's a baby Christian. Have you ever played, with, played a game with a baby? Do you know a baby expects to win the game every time? And when the baby loses, they always say, you cheated, right? Because I expect to win every time. Have you ever, have you ever know, do you know that a, a, you can't take a baby to war? See? Do you know that, that a baby can't be controlled naturally, that you've got to walk with these? For the parents out there, you know. Some of you know. And, and what you've learned, watch this. A good parent knows when you see your grandchildren, you see it early on, don't you? Because you've seen that before, right? I know that behavior. Because it's a baby. 
And here's the thing. Have you ever noticed, parents, when you, with the authority in your voice, not just a regular no, but when you look at your child with authority and tell them no, they break up, don't they? It's like you took their candy. They just fall out, right? They just have a temper tantrum, right? How's the baby doing? Baby's like, acting, he's acting up, right? Okay. Do you know that a baby can't hold an office in the church? Yeah. A baby, a baby can't. What, what is Paul saying? Paul says, I want to talk about heavy matters. But I can't because you're a baby. Because baby wants to have their own way. But when you come to the kingdom of God, you got to submit. Tired, take that baby. <laughs> and, and don't you bring that baby home. Please don't bring that baby home. <laughs> And watch this. Spiritual warfare is when you mature in the Lord. And you're able to look beyond the flesh and see what's happening in the spiritual realm. That you don't react flesh to flesh because when you react flesh to flesh, then you're fighting, you're fighting flesh to flesh. And you use flesh weapons, voice. You use your anger words. You use all those things because you're fighting flesh to flesh. But when you fight in the spirit, you look beyond the flesh. And you're able to see there's something else going on with this person. Oh, I'm not going to argue back with you. I'm not going to cuss back at you. I'm not going to send an ugly message to you. I got your ugly message, but what I'm going to send to you is prayer. I'm going to forgive you for what you said. Because I'm, I'm mature. I can look beyond that. That's, why, that's, why, that's what parents do. When your child act out, you don't throw your child away. You better not. Why? Because you say, this, he's three years old. And he'll, he'll grow out of that. And I got to be patient with him because he'll mature and he'll grow out of that. What Paul is saying to the people in the church, by now you should have matured. That's what he's saying. Because you're still arguing about petty matters. And there's a vision and you have, you have issues with one another. Let me show you why you, can't, you have to be careful with babies in the church. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul is going to lay this on the church because Paul says, now this is what I want to talk to you about. I want you to know the arsenal that you have. I want you to know the power of being a Christian a mature believer in Christ. I want you to know the weapons that you have in your spiritual warfare that everyone else, everyone is engaged in. Well, Paul says this in verse number t three of chapter number 10 of 2 Corinthians, for though we live in the body, we do not wage war in an unspiritual way. Paul says, I know you're in the flesh. I, I know you're just a person, just a man, just a woman, but we don't wage war in an unspiritual manner. We don't return ugly message for ugly message and, and, and ugly posts for ugly posts. No, no, no. We don't wage war like that. Verse 4. Since the weapons of our warfare are not worldly, but watch this. Our weapons are powerful through God. Look at the power. For the demolition of strongholds. Let me get your attention. What Paul is saying is the power that God has invested in each of us in warfare, in your life, is it has the power to break demolish strongholds. What strongholds? Addictive behavior. <laughs> that the power of Christ in us gives us the power to break strongholds, not only in our lives, in your life, in your children's lives. Strongholds. Let's go further. Strongholds. We demolish arguments. What is he talking about? Our conversation. Remember early on, he said, hey, you guys are having strife. You're having petty arguments among each other. He says, the weapons of our warfare can demolish petty arguments. And every high-minded thing that is raised up against the knowledge of God. Hold it. Every high-minded thing that's raised against the knowledge of God, this is, this is how you can know it is. When somebody says, hey, I know that's what the Bible says, but they're in trouble right there. Because the knowledge of God is supreme. Amen, church. If the Bible said it, then that's the way it needs to go. Amen? There's no addition to it. And everything that raises itself against the knowledge of God, and watch this, and taking every thought captive, I love this, to obey Christ. Paul says the power that we have as Christians, that you can make your thought life obedient to Jesus. I'm just a man, preacher, hold it now. I'm just a man. I'm, I'm, this is not, my thought life is my thought life. I can't control what I think. Oh, that's, I know why, because you're just a baby. And you're comfortable with a baby. You, you get a pacifier every now and then. But when you mature, 
then your desire is to bring your thoughts to be obedient to Jesus. That's warfare. That's engaged in a battle. This is, what, this is what Joshua, them, they, they didn't do this. They, they looked at the outward appearance. They saw. Remember, they, they pointed to the things you could see. They said, listen, look at our, look at our wineskins. They're old. Look at our bread. It's crumbly. Look at our clothes. They're worn out. Look at the outward appearance. And see, what Jesus, what God would tell them later on in 1 Samuel, don't look at the outward appearance. God looks where, church? In the heart. <laughs> and if Joshua got counsel from God, God would have showed him, he would have shown him their heart, shown him their heart. Hey, listen, their hearts, they're deceiving you, Joshua, but they didn't seek counsel. Brothers and sisters, this is the essence of spiritual warfare where we seek counsel from God. I, I got to take you on this journey. Go, go with me very quickly to Isaiah 37. Now, let me show you how this is supposed to work. Let me show you how warfare is supposed to work for a, a child of God. I'll show it to you in the Old Testament. In Isaiah chapter 37, there's this great battle that's about to happen. A, a strong, mighty king by the name of Zennacherib is calling on King Hezekiah and telling King Hezekiah, I'm on my way and I'm going to utterly destroy you. And what the enemy always does, and the reason why he sent a message and a letter, because he wanted Hezekiah to fear. The enemy always sends you threats. And the threats comes to make you fear. Okay. And, because, and, and then when you fear, then you will not react in, right, in the right way. And so he sends a letter, he sends a messenger to Hezekiah and says, I'm on my way and I'm going to destroy everything in my path. Verse number one of Isaiah 37, when King Hezekiah heard about this report, he tore his clothes, he put on sackcloth, and he did what church? He went where? To the house of the Lord. He went to the Lord's temple. When he heard this, he didn't go to his generals and say, hey, listen, Zennacherib is coming. Get your forces together. Sharpen all your swords. Get the horses together. Get the chariots together. No, no, no. The king went to the temple of God. Zennacherib writes this letter. And then look at verse number 14. Uh, Hezekiah took the letter from the messenger. He read it. Then he went to the Lord's temple again. And look what he did. He spread it out before the Lord. I love this. <laughs> Hezekiah went to the Lord and said, Lord, would you look at this letter? Look what he said to me. Look what I'm dealing with. I know you know already, but I want to show you what I'm dealing with. What would the church look like if we came here every week and we showed the Lord what we're dealing with? And not only did he do that, what's the next verse say? Verse number 15. Then Hezekiah did what? He did what, church? He prayed. He sought the Lord's counsel. He, he's not talking to people. He's talking to the Lord. He says, Lord, look at this. And then Hezekiah prayed. He, he prayed a, a favorite. You need to read the whole chapter. It, it will bless your life. But skip down to verse number 21. Then God sends an answer. Then, Josh, then Isaiah, son of Amos, sent a messenger to Hezekiah. The Lord, the God of Israel, says, because you did what? Prayed to me. Because you prayed to me about Zennacherib, the, the king of Assyria, this is what the Lord will tell you. And God's going to give him a promise. And God's promise is, you're not going to have to fight this battle. I'm going to fight this battle. And what was the catalyst for this? Because you did what, church? Pray. You sought my counsel. And on that day, 185 soldiers died because one man prayed. That's spiritual warfare. And he did not have to lift a finger. He did not have to write one email. <laughs> He showed it to the Lord, and he inquired of the Lord, and he waited for the Lord. Brothers and sisters, part of spiritual warfare is waiting for the Lord and not taking up matters in your own fleshly hands, but warring in the spirit. I got to wrap this up. So how, how did it end up for these Gibeonite people? I, I want to show you something. It's very interesting who they were. Um, let me, let me show it to you. Go to Joshua chapter 10. Skip over. Joshua 10. Let me show you um, the, the quality of these people. Verse number two. Adonai Zedek and his people were greatly alarmed because Gibeon was a large city like one of the royal cities. So, so what's going to happen here? Um, in three days later, they're going to walk to this city, Gibeonite, Gibeon. 
And so when they go to the city of Gibeon, they're going to find out, hey, you guys said you were for a far country. You're just three days away from us. You lied to us. You deceived us. And so let me tell you the strength of these people. It was a royal city, and it was larger than Ai. And not only that, all of the men of the city were men of war. So Joshua was deceived by a, a, a city that was stronger, larger. It's a royal city. It's very distinctive. You don't hear that with Jericho. You didn't hear that with Ahai. You heard this with Gibeon. It was a royal city, and the people were people of war. And so now Joshua has made a deal with the enemy. But I want you to know something. God was in it. Let me show you how. Early on, we met a woman by the name of Rahab. Y'all remember Rahab? And Rahab made a covenant with the men. She said, listen, now, I'm going to help you out, but you need to help me out. When you come to the city, make sure you take care of me and my family. And she hid the men. Now, Rahab lied just like they did. Remember, the people came to Rahab's door and said, where are the people from Israel? They said, we don't know. They, they're gone. If you catch them, you can go out and catch them. Maybe you can catch them. She lied. They were hiding upstairs. But she made a covenant with them. She said, listen, now I'm going to protect you, but I want you to protect me. And they made a covenant with her. Everybody inside your household will be saved. If they're outside the household, that's on them. But if they're in the household, they're going to be saved. And the Bible says because God gave her faith in Hebrews chapter 11, God gave her the gift of faith was given to her to believe in the God of Israel. And because of the gift of faith, she now becomes the great, 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 great grandparent of Jesus Christ. David, even King David. Because of the faith that was given to us, to her. Because of the faith that was given to the Gibeonite people, they believed. You saw early on, we heard of your God. We heard of the great power. And we fear your God. And we want to have a treaty with you. We want to be at peace with you. We want to join with you. And God allowed it to be so. Time would not allow me to tell you, but these Gibeonite people are all over the, New Test I mean, the Old Testament. These people are found in Nehemiah to help build the wall. Gibeon is a place where the Ark of the Covenant would be placed several times to rest at Gibeon. So God's providence and God's plan was for the Gibeonite people to be there and for this Gentile people to be identified with his holy people. This is a glimpse of the church. This is a glimpse of God's idea that there will be no partition, that there will not be these people and those other people, but we'll all be one people. This is a glimpse of the salvation that God gifted to these Gentile people. 2 Samuel 21, I won't go there. I just have to tell you what happens. Later on, Saul is going to rage war against these people, and he's going to, he's going to devour them. He's going to wipe a lot of the Gibeonites away, Saul in his fury. And later on in 2 Samuel chapter 21, David is king now. And now Israel has a, a, a famine. And David seeks the Lord, said, Lord, why are we going through three years? Three years of famine. And God said, it's because of what Saul did to the Gibeonite people. Because I gave them my word that I would take care of them. And Saul fought against them. He fought against my covenant with them. And because of that, I'm holding back your resources because of my covenant to those people. And David went to them and said, we've got to make this right so that God can bless us. Because, watch this, God's covenant to them was so strong until he made his people submit to them. Can you imagine that? To get an alignment, to make it right. Because now they're part of the covenant of God. I've got more, but you got to go home. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today. What manner of love you've bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. <laughs> it does not yet appear what we should be, but when you appear, we shall be like you. Father, today, I pray that we would not walk in deception, willful deception. I pray, Lord Jesus, that we would grow up, that we would mature, that we wouldn't be babies in Christ, drinking only milk and never eating of the meat of your word, which brings about maturity. Father, forgive us. We get caught up in just small arguments and small territorial, territorial issues 
when the kingdom is so big? Father, we pray for mature men to be elders of your church, not babies, men willing to work out relational issues, men willing to submit, men willing to be humble, men willing to stand for the word of God. Send elders, we pray. In Jesus' name I pray, and everybody said amen. Would you stand with me, please? I want you to grab the hand of the person next to you. If you're here today and you realize, preacher, you know, in this prayer, in this, in this time, I've been walking in deception. I've joined myself with someone that's not like me. I made an arrangement. I made a deal. I didn't seek the Lord's counsel. Now I'm reaping the repercussions of that decision. I want you to know something. God is merciful. He's merciful. Although Joshua did not seek the Lord's counsel, it worked out good. Because what the enemy can mean for evil in your life, God can make it good. Yes. Even today. I want you to make your way to this altar. We want to pray for you. Father, we thank you today. We thank you. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Give us willing hearts. Father, today we leave, we hang ten today. We give of our tithes and offering to you cheerfully, joyfully, not out of compulsion, but with a grateful heart. And I pray that out of his glorious riches, he strengthen us with power through his spirit in our inner beings so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. I pray we've been rooted, grounded in his love, may have power together with all God's people to grasp how wide, how long, how high, how deep the love of Christ is for us. And to know his love that surpasses the ability to comprehend that we might be filled to the fullness of the measure of God in our lives. And now to our great God, he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or imagine. To him be all the glory, the majesty, the dominion and power forever and ever we pray. And those who love Jesus said, amen. God bless you.